The sporogenous tissue usually con it usually controls the ploidy and it undergoes meiosis, which is reductional division. Very so good. yes. That's okay. That's and good. okay. And one more thing that it is made up of homogeneous cells, right? One type of cells. All right. Um, can you tell me something about tapical? Is it the innermost layer or the outermost layer? So the tapicum is the innermost layer and its function is to provide nutrition to the growing microsporangium, to the developing microsporangium. And, and the special feature about it is that it has a dense cytoplasm and it has more than one nucleus. Very good. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. All right. So um, what, okay, today we'll do a new topic. Yeah, and I was saying one thing that your mother wanted to talk to me. Yes, ma'am. Uh, regarding the classes. Uh, I suppose so, yes. All right. So, like, uh, by the time we end the session, uh, if it is possible, you can call your mother and then I'll talk during this particular session. Okay. Yes, ma'am. She actually suggested that. So, yeah, I didn't want you to know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, after I'm done uh, uh, teaching you the topic, then you can call your mother and I'll uh, have a chat. All right. Okay. So today's topic is microsporogenesis. Micro means small. Porogenesis means microspore. Small spores, genesis. Right? Genesis is formation. So microsporogenesis is the formation of microspores. All right? Now see, the process of formation of pollen grains from pollen mother cell through meiosis is known as microsporogenesis. The process of formation of pollen grains and pollen grains are the male gametes, right? They are the male gametes or male gametophyte. Okay, so the process of formation of pollen grains from pollen mother cell through the process of meiosis, which is the reductional division, as you know, reductional division. And this whole process is known as microsporogenesis, meaning the formation of microspore. Clear? Now, see, whenever the anther develops, okay, we studied that the anther has so many walls and so many cells present, in, present inside, isn't it? The first one was epidermis, then there was endothecium, middle layer, tapetum, and then there was sporogenous tissue, okay? So if you come from the outermost part to the innermost part, there, this number of cells increases, isn't it? First there were walls, then there were the huge mass of cells, and those cells or those tissues were sporogenous cells, okay? So as the anther develops, the cells of the sporogenous tissues, they undergo meiotic division to form a microspore tetrad. Okay, a tetrad is formed. So the sporogenous tissues, which you told me about, right? Those tissues, the cells which are present in them. Achha, do you know that uh, a group of cells make tissues and a group of tissues make organ? And a group of organ makes an organ system. Yes, organ system. So the cells which are present in the sporogenous tissue, they undergo meiotic division, meaning reductional division, to restore the ploidy level, and they form a microspore tetrad. Now, tetra, you understand tetra? Yes, four. Yes, four. Okay. So see, now how is the division, like how it happens? So the sporogenous tissues, they divide mitotically, okay? Or, you, yeah, mitotically to form microspore mother cell. So first they were sporogenous tissues, then they divided mitotically. So what was the other name of mitosis? Are the name of my Equation, Equational division. Yes, correct. Very good. Equational division. So the sporogenous tissues, they divide mitotically. And what they form? They form the microspore mother cell. Okay. Then this microspore mother cells divides meiotically. 
which is reductional division. Okay, they divide meiotically and then form a microspore tetrad, and then from the microspore tetrad, pollen grains are formed. This is the end product that we require for um, the fertilization or the pollination. And what is a microspore tetrad? So a microspore tetrad is a cluster of four cells. If you look at the diagram over here, so here microspore mother cell looks like this. Okay, it undergoes meiosis one. Okay, meiosis uh, usually meiosis happens in two phases. The first one is the reductional phase, and then there is the uh, equation. Okay. Um, um, earlier you mentioned equational first, right? No, that C, that equational was when sporogenous tissues are formed into microspore mother cells. Those, see, this here, it is starting from the microspore mother cell, isn't it? So mm -hmm. this microspore mother cell is formed mitotically. Okay, it is formed. Now, on like this microspore mother cell undergoes meiosis. Okay, now see, we don't reach to four, like if you're standing at one, you don't reach to four directly. You have to go through two, three, and then you'll reach four, isn't it? That's how it goes. So here also, if this is one cell, you can see one cell here, this thing, it is, isn't it one cell? So one cell cannot directly be divided into four cells, isn't it? It has to go through a set of division first being two. Here, this is two cells. Can you see two cells here? And then these two cells further divide meiotically. And then finally, four cells are formed. And this four cluster or this, this structure is known as a microspore tetrad. Here. So first of all, it starts with the sporogenous tissue. Let's start from the start. Okay. It starts from the epidermis. Then there is the endothelium. Then there are middle layers. There is tapetum and then there is sporogenous tissue. Now those sporogenous tissues or the cells of those tissues, they divide mitotically, meaning equational division takes place and they form a microspore mother cell. And then that microspore mother cell divides or undergoes meiotic one, meiosis one and forms a dyad. Dyad, dye means to die or by means to, right? So it divides meiotically the first meiosis and forms a microspore dyad. Okay, two cell stage is a dyad. And then this dyad undergoes another meiosis, which is meiosis two. And finally, a microspore tetrad is formed. And then from this microspore tetrad, pollen grains are formed. So you understand the chronology? Yes, ma'am. Well, I have something to do. Okay. Yes. After you finish using, can you give me a few seconds to note it down because I'm bad at multitasking. I can either listen or write. Yes, so. Sure, definitely, definitely. Do you need time right now? Yes, ma'am, please. Okay, okay. Write thank it down you, and then tell me you when please, you're... Can you please okay, go a little yeah. down? And thank you. Is it thank fine? You. Okay. Please scroll down.
then okay now see uh, this whole chronology of how um, pollen grains are formed from sporogenous tissues is clear to you yes ma'am okay good very good now see now there is a thing known as microsporangium okay the microspores are formed inside the microsporangium okay so this structure is the structure that forms the microspores are known as microsporangium okay so inside each microsporangium there are several thousands of microspores okay now see um when we talk about the dehiscence of anther do you remember that the anther bursts so as to you know scatter the pollen grains everywhere since the pollen grains are not mobile, mobile. Right? yes so um this uh, see this is the reason why uh, since they are not mobile so they cannot move from one place to another that's point number 1 then there is another point that since this anther bursts or the dehiscence takes place so can you imagine this for example something is bursting then a lot of its constituents would go to different places right it would scatter a lot now it does not ensure that whatever the constituent is if it's being bursted out or it is being scattered out it won't it's necessarily fall on to the right place right it is not necessary that it will you know perfectly fall on to the right place where it is supposed to it would go either here or either there some of them will be wasted right so in order to compensate for this particular loss because plants can't do anything about this loss there is uh, sometimes there is a lot of wind blowing there is sometimes there is rain so when the anther dehisces or the dehiscence of the anther takes place those pollens are released but to compensate for the loss the production of pollen is a lot okay there are thousands and thousands of pollens or microspores made so that even if some of them are being lost still a majority of them are good you know working so that is the reason why there are thousands and thousands of microspore inside microsporangium clear okay now let's talk about the main or the hero of the show the hero is the pollen grain because without the hero the movie won't go on isn't it so without pollen grains no fertilization can take place obviously it is the male gametophyte it is the paternal side in the plant so pollen grains they are the male gametophyte and how do they look like so they are usually spherical okay they are usually spherical the shape is spherical what is their size so their size is 25 to 50 micrometers just imagine there is meter there is centimeter and then there is micrometer right so 25 to 50 micrometers in diameter is its the diameter of the pollen grain is 25 to 50 micrometers and it is spherical in shape the shape is spherical and the pollen grain has two walls okay there are two walls present the first one is known as exine and the next one is known as intine okay yes so let's talk about these walls and how what they do how they make it so special so the first one the wall is exine it is the outer wall okay it is the outer layer and it is very hard okay and everything is made up of something right so this outer layer is made up of sporopollenin okay sporopollenin is the substance through which this exine or the outer layer is made and this substance or this organic material makes the wall hard and resistant okay now something about this sporopollenin because proteins we know fat we know right carbohydrates we know all of these are common things right but 
sporopollenin is a new word that we are learning isn't it so spore talking about the sporopollenin it is an organic material and it is one of the most resistant organic material resistant meaning it is very strong it can withstand all the harsh weather conditions and environment conditions all of those sorts of things so the the characteristic feature of sporopollenin is that it is one of the most resistant organic material okay and because it is resistant and you know it is the most hard substance that is why it helps the pollen to have a hard outer layer sorts of you know perform the protection of the pollen okay and this particular organic material which is sporopollenin it can withstand high temperature you know it can you know, tolerate high temperature and it can also tolerate strong acids and you should also write alkalis alkalis you understand no see acids mm, and bases yeah you do okay yes, alkalis are basically bases like how acids are there so uh, the sporopollenin can withstand high temperature it can withstand or tolerate strong acids if you were to throw you know if it got to a surrounding where there is a lot of strong acid present or alkali present so it can withstand it okay the structure is of that sort then there is no enzyme that can degrade sporopollenin okay now do you understand that uh, all of the things that are present in the world whether it is calcium whether it is um what is that uh, carbohydrates or whether it is protein there are a set of enzymes that can destroy it even there are enzymes that can destroy dna and rna also right but sporopollenin is the only organic material that no enzyme can degrade at all there is no such enzyme that can degrade sporopollenin okay now talking about the enzyme do you need time to write okay 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 so talking about the enzyme so the enzyme of the pollen grain it has a prominent aperture now do you understand the word aperture that means like a small area yeah like a small, small opening. opening yes very good very correct so uh the exine for example uh this this is the outer layer of the pollen so it has an aperture where sporopollenin is not present okay there is an aperture or an opening where sporopollenin is absent so it means that it is not a structure like this right there is a hole or a prominent aperture present where in sporopollenin is not present and this structure or this aperture is known as germ pore okay it is known as germ pore okay um why this germ this germ is not for the germs that we know do you know germs yes ma'am what are germs bacteria yeah uh, combination yes. bacteria viruses yes so those are known as germs but here there are two things okay in our body and in plants body also there are in general two types of cells okay i'll um, explain it here here okay see cells are of two types the first one is somatic cell okay and the next one is germs okay so the somatic cells are those cells that are not involved in reproduction okay meaning the cells of our eye the cells of our hand the cells of our legs the cells of our heart all of these are somatic cells 
But when I talk about ovum, when I talk about sperm, when I talk about pollens, all of those are germ cells because they are involved in the reproduction. Okay. So that is what this germ is about. Germinal. Okay. It is not germs like those bacteria and viruses. It is germ cells, which means the cells that are involved in the reproduction. And the cells that are not involved in the reproduction, they are known as somatics. So, yeah. so these are the two cells. That is what uh, the germ pore meaning. This pore is very important for the facilitation of, you know, formation of pollen tube. It happens later. You'll uh, learn about it in the next topic. But for now, you have to remember that the, the continuity of the exine is not entire. Okay, there is one place where sporopollenin is absent and that particular place is known as a germ pore. It is a sort of an aperture, a very prominent one, meaning you can easily visualize it. Okay, it is not hidden or anything. It is very prominent and it is an aperture, meaning an opening. Okay, now see. Pollen grains are very well preserved as fossils. Okay, do you understand what fossils are? Yes, ma'am, like old bones or animals or very, yes, yes. very remains, ancient, yes. ancient remains. Yes, correct. The ancient remains of the animals of those times, wherein there were bones, teeth, nails, all of these structures. So this, they are known as fossils. Now, why are fossils important? Because when we see or look at the fossils, we can learn about how animals were at that time and how different they are at this time, right? We can study about the evolution and all the paleontological studies can be done. So when we talk about pollen grains, so pollen grains are very well preserved as fossils, meaning they are excellent fossils. Now, how? because of the presence of that sporopollenin, which is, as I told you, the hardest or the most resistant substance. Okay, it is one of the most resistant substance. And I also said that there is no enzyme present that can degrade sporopollenin. Okay, so for example, a pollen grain fell to the ground and there was like, it did not, you know, participate in the fertilization because it, it fell in onto the ground and not onto the female part, the stigma. So after years and years, the, that pollen grain will still be there. It won't perish. Do you understand that the muscles of us, they perish after a while. We decompose, right? But this sporopollenin will not decompose. Why? Because there is no enzyme that can act on it to degrade it. There is nothing that can degrade it. Human muscles, human body can get degraded, right? But sporopollenin can't. Now, since it can't get degraded, so do you understand it? It will be like that for thousands and thousands of years, isn't it? And mm -hmm. that is the reason why pollen grains are the best fossils. Since their outer covering is so hard, nothing can destroy them. So it, it is saved for thousands and thousands of years. Clear? Yes, ma'am. But then pollen grains, right? They tend to lose their, like, depending upon the type of pollen grain, they tend to lose their viability pretty quickly, right? So, yes. So doesn't the sporopollen play a role in any of that? See, uh, pollen viability has no, like, nothing to do with the exine or the sporopollen. The sporopollenin is just a material of which the exine is made up of. Okay, exine is made up of sporopollenin. So it is the structure. But the viability, the gametes, they decrease after a certain while. And it is not that if they do not get onto the female plant, it would decrease like within the snap of the moment. No, uh, sometimes it can be retained for a little longer. Sometimes for a few months also. It depends on species and species in different families also. And uh, sometimes it is 2,000 years. See, uh, there is a plant known as Phoenix Deptilifera. Okay, it is date palm. Okay, the, this 
the pollen of it germinated after 2000 years later just imagine so the viability of that is 2000 then if you talk about rice or wheat the viability is just 30 minutes but again back to coming to your question uh, the viability has no relation with the sporopollenin since sporopollenin is just the material of which exine is made okay so the outermost layer was exine now the inner layer is known as intine okay intine so it is a thin and it is continuous meaning there is no aperture present in the intine it is thin and it is continuous and it is made up of cellulose and pectin what other thing is made up of cellulose do you know in plants there is one thing I, that is i know i know it is what makes plants plants But the leaves the whole plant body something is there which is made up of cellulose not just one thing go back to the very basic structure think about the cell i know you know it but just think about it no no i know i know it hmm. There is something that is made up of cellulose. Okay, I'll give you a hint. The thing that is made up of cellulose in plant is absent in animals. Now that it is very easy. I know the it's it's okay. I'll give you the initials of that word. That's the last hint. I feel very stupid right now. <laughs> it's all right. Try to guess. I'll tell the answer then. And then you'll feel so, so stupid. <laughs> because I know you know the answer. Okay, fine. Cell wall. <laughs> cell wall is the answer. Cell wall is made up of cellulose and cell wall is not present in any animal. Okay. I gave you so many hints. Okay. So that particular thing, uh, okay, coming back to the topic, the inner wall of the pollen, which is known as the intine, is made up of cellulose and pectin. These are the two compounds that the intine is made up of. And intine is thin. There is no thick intine. There is, it is thin and it is continuous, meaning there is no aperture or any opening present in the intine. Clear? Also, when we talk about the cytoplasm of the pollen grain, see, uh, we talked about the outer wall, we talked about the inner wall. Now, what encloses it? Cytoplasm is present, like how it is present in a normal cell. So, the cytoplasm of the pollen grain is surrounded by the plasma membrane, like how other cells have plasma membrane around them. Same way, pollen grains also have plasma membrane around. The cytoplasm is surrounded by plasma membrane. Now you can write it down. Now, when a pollen grain matures, okay, after all those divisions and everything, when the pollen grain is finally matured, see the FIG that I was telling you about, do you see here how it is uh, giving a caption of what the drawing is about? Yes, do you see here? It says figure and the figure is a pollen grain, right? This is what I was saying about the diagram. No matter what you draw, you must and must give this caption. So that the teacher would know what you have drawn. Okay. Understood? Okay. 
Now, when a mature pollen grain, like a pollen grain, after all those steps of division, finally when it matures, so a mature pollen grain contains two types of cells. Okay, the first one is vegetative cell, and then there is a generative cell. Those are the two cells. Now, if you look at here in this particular diagram, do you see this part? There is a demarcated part here. It is divided, isn't it? So this first part is the vegetative cell. And this second part is the generative cell. Okay, the two cells, vegetative and generative. Okay, now see, uh, I talked about exine. Do you see the exine? It is an irregular structure and it is made up of what? Sporopollen. Sporopollen. And then there is intine, which is the innermost layer and it is made up of? Cellulose and pectin. Yes. What other thing is made up of cellulose? Cell wall. Mm. Okay. So um, one thing that you must remember here about the pollen grain or how it looks like. So when you will talk about the vegetative cell, the vegetative cell is always the bigger one. Always remember, it is always the bigger cell, okay? And the generative one is always the smaller one, okay? Now, you can draw this if you want. What is tube cell over here? The tube cell. The tube cells are basically present for the formation of pollen tube. Okay. So what happens is that during the process of fertilization, there is a formation of pollen tube so that the pollen grains can go inside the pistil. Okay. So that is why tube cells are there. They are responsible for the formation of pollen tube. Then, yes, okay. Now, talking about the vegetative cell, as I told you, it is the bigger one. Okay, so when you'll write about it, you must mention that it is the bigger one and it has abundant food reserve. That is why it is bigger because it has a reservoir of food present or a lot of food storage is there, and that is the reason why it is bigger. And it has a large, irregularly shaped nucleus. If you look at here in the diagram, do you see that the nucleus here is bigger, isn't it, than this one? Right. Since yes. the cell is bigger, the nucleus is also bigger. So it has a large nucleus, and that nucleus is irregular. Irregular that it does, it is not a said shape. Okay, it is an irregular shape. Clear? Yeah. Now. The next type of cell, which was the generative cell, it is the small cell and it floats in the cytoplasm of the vegetative cell. The generative cell floats in the cytoplasm of the vegetative cell and obviously it is smaller than the vegetative cell and the nucleus is also small and it is spindle shaped with dense cytoplasm. Even though the generative cell is smaller, but it has a dense cytoplasm. Dense meaning thick cytoplasm. Clear? Yeah? Now see, this particular structure wherein you can see two cells, isn't it? The vegetative cell and the generative cell. So th this thing is known as the two-cell stage. Okay, this is known as the two-cell stage. Okay. Now, 
in 60% of the angiosperms meaning in 60% of the flowering plants the the pollen grains are shed at the two cell stage meaning whenever the pollen matures and it finally reaches the two cell stage then dehiscence the takes place and they are shed at this two cell stage okay but what about the remaining one so in the remaining species like 60% of the angiosperms have two cell stage of the pollen grain but the remaining one apart from the 60 meaning the 40% they are uh, um basically other than the angiosperms there are a lot of other plants also so other than them the generative cell further divides okay a division is again taken place and it divides mitotically to give rise to two male gametes okay and this this is known as the three cell stage when the generative cell divides mitotically to give rise to two male gametes and this is known as three cell stage and it occurs in the remaining species other than the angiosperm is it clear Okay. Now, uh, this is what uh, the whole thing about the pollen and how the cell is, how it looks like, how many cells are there, and in what cell state they are shed. Okay. Now, do you understand that the generative cell undergoes division and then further forms two gametes, and then they are shed. Okay. So those gametes directly reach the female part, but when we talk about the two cell stage here in the pollen grain would land on a stigma and then the tube cell would form a pollen tube then the division would take place and then the male gametes would reach the o ovule okay now have you heard about hay fever no ma'am first no? Uh, those are uh, the seasonal fever that people get oh, seasonal they were in they, they sneeze a lot they have a very runny nose right see many people are allergic to the substances that are present in the air right they are allergic to the dust maybe and other particles so uh, the pollen grains also contribute to this to some extent meaning as i said what is the size of the pollen grain the general size 25 to 30 micrometers yes 25 to 50 micrometers so the pollen grains of many species they cause severe allergy okay they cause a lot of allergies and bronchial affliction meaning disorders to the respiratory tract and many allergies and it leads to chronic respiratory disorders meaning it starts from a little allergy and then it finally develops into a proper disorder a chronic respiratory disorder particularly asthma and bronchitis you must like uh, uh, do you know people uh, with asthma in your um friends circle or anybody who has asthma yes ma'am they see they carry an inhaler with them right because sometimes the bronchi the they constrict in them. they are they find it unable to you know breathe they find it difficult to breathe so uh, asthma is a sort of allergy okay if at initial stage it can be caused by the pollen grains now see as i said that when the pollen grains are shed or when the bursting happens imagine it can go everywhere right meaning it can stay in the environment also and since it is such a small size it can go up our respiratory tract when we breathe in isn't it now see some people are fine because some people have better immunity right but some people don't have immunities a good one they have weaker immunity 
so they got allergies to them they get allergic so pollen grains they cause severe allergies in some people clear not in all people and those allergies may result into formation of a chronic respiratory disease in which two types of diseases can happen the first one is asthma and the second one is bronchitis clear okay now see um or do you understand or do I, okay or do you remember the rules for writing the scientific name of any organism um oh, yes ma'am it must be written in italics it must be handwritten there must be space between the first word and the second word and then every time we started i think you have to start it with a capital letter i apologize okay. only remember a few okay so you said there are two words do you know the names of those two words what is the first word known as and what is the next word known as no ma'am i i can only think of mangifera indica because that's the example we learned okay, that is the example correct the example is right but the word mangifera is a genus and then the indica is the species yes specific epithet or the species name so whenever you write the genus name it starts with a capital letter and whenever you write the species name it starts with a lower case letter is it clear and when you're handwriting it you're writing it with a pen then you underline both the words separately meaning the genus name and the specific epithets are underlined separately but if you're typing it then you italicize it. It, you write it in italics so see uh, there is a plant whose scientific name is parthenium okay and the common name is carrot grass okay so this plant was imported to india accidentally okay what happened uh, you understand that there are certain goods that are imported and then there are certain goods that are exported in and out of india or anywhere yes, okay not just india or anywhere yes. so uh, what happened when in india uh, there was the importing of wheat okay so along with wheat there was this parthenium or the carrot grass that came as a contaminant accidentally the parthenium or the carrot grass came into india and it causes severe pollen allergy this parthenium not wheat wheat was imported and along with wheat came parthenium accidentally and it causes severe pollen allergy okay so this name is important to remember because it may be asked in questions in mcqs so parthenium and the common name is carrot grass okay now just like parthenium there are some other plants whose pollen causes allergy now this plant does not causes allergy the pollen from this plant would cause allergy okay now see there is amaranthus and there is chenopodium these two are the other uh, plants whose pollen causes allergy so all together there are three the first one is parthenia or the common name is carrot grass the second one is amaranthus and then the third one is the chenopodium clear so you must remember all these three examples now talking about the pollen grain see pollen grains are rich in nutrients okay they are very nutritious and they are rich in specially protein okay they are very proteinaceous the protein content is high they are rich in all sorts of nutrients so pollen grains are often used as food supplements okay they are used as food supplements in the form of tablets and syrups okay now what it does since it is you know high in protein and other sorts of nutrients they give us energy okay quick energy to perform a task so whenever someone consumes pollen it increases the performance and particularly who uses this so athletes who need to run a lot who need to you know stand for longer hours so athletes and then the race horses 
the race horses you know they also need to run a lot and stand a lot and all that so the increases the increment in the performance or the enhancement of the performance performance is done by the pollen consumption why because pollen is rich in nutrients and especially protein content is very high understood so write it down Okay. Ma'am, no. this is this is more of an intrusive thought, but then the pollen grain is made out of spore of pollen, right? So if we consume it. If we consume it, see, uh that's that's a very good thought, but I don't know so what happened. Yeah, that's why I said it was an intrusive. Yeah, I think I think the spore of pollen is not consumed. Rather, the pollen uh the male gametes are consumed maybe who knows right i don't think if we eat uh, sporopollen and then obviously it won't be degraded right how would we digest it yeah that's a, that's a very good question you we must search on it isn't it yeah so uh, also uh, the the supplements they are taken in the form of tablets and syrups so i think the extract from the pollen is used not the pollen as a whole right the protein content or the nutrient content is used that is why it is safe for us to okay now let's talk about the last topic which is the pollen viability or see after the pollen grains are shed or they are bursted open into the air they have a time period like how cinderella had a time period she had to go back before the clock strike 12 right Pollens also have a viability or a time period that they have to land on the stigma, on that like during that time period, so as to fertilization, so that fertilization can take place, and also before they lose viability, meaning before they are like useless to the uh, fertilization process. There is a certain period of time wherein the male gametes are. able to fuse with the female gamete and form a zygote so this has to happen in a certain time period or a time frame okay so the time period for which the pollen is viable it is different for different plants right for example in one plant it is 30 minutes then again that date palm that i told you about it had 2000 years imagine 2000 years so the viability is different it, it is different for different species and it depends on the temperature and humidity also okay these factors affect the viability for example let's say a uh, pollen is viable for 20 minutes but when they are released the temperature is so high that the pollen is you know not able to survive that thing clear so that is how it is uh, like different for different species and also it depends on the temperature and the humidity clear yeah? now uh, let us talk about some examples so pollen viability in some cereals cereal plants such as rice and wheat the pollen viability is 30 minutes after they are released okay they are viable only for 30 minutes for example if it has been you know uh more than 30 minutes and then they land on the stigma no fertilization will take place because the pollen is not viable anymore it is of no use any clear so for the cereals such as rice and wheat the pollen viability is 30 minutes after they are released and then there are some you know members of the family like rosaceae leguminosae and solanaceae okay these are the floral families so the members of these families the pollen is viable for months okay they are vi viable for months so even if when the pollen is shed and it lands on the stigma after a month still the fertilization would take place why because the viability is for months but in the case of rice and wheat the pollen if it lands on the stigma after one day no fertilization will take place because the pollen is not viable anymore 
here. Now, we will talk about cryopreservation. Now, what is cryopreservation? See, cryopreservation, uh, for example, do you know anything about artificial insemination? Yes, ma'am. How the sperms are usually preserved for a long time in high, very low temperatures. Yes. And then they can be later used. Like, yes. like their viability is preserved. Yes. See, we preserve it. Now, for example, it has to be transported to some other place. Okay. So you can't take it in the hand, isn't it? You have to store it in some sort of a way so as to transport it. And also, uh, we have to store it in that way that it is not destroyed. It is still viable. It is still perfect to use. So this method is usually done in animals also. Okay. It is done in animals also. And that technique of, you know, artificially injecting the semen or the sperm into the female was known as artificial, artificial insemination. So whenever the reproduction has to be, you know, out of the way, different from what human body does, then that is artificial, right? It is not natural. And insemination is basically the, uh, the sperm or the semen going inside the body of the female. So the artificially done insemination, that is, that happens why? Because the male gametes or the gametes are in general preserved. So that for one, it can be transported from one place to another. And also, like, for example, it has been preserved and it is not needed now, but it might be needed in the future and it can be used later on also. Yeah. So that thing, if we talk about in plants, that process of preservation or the storage of pollen grains, it is known as cryopreservation. Okay. And this, you can save or store pollen grain for years. Okay not just some days, years in liquid nitrogen. It is done in liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees Celsius. So imagine how cold, right? So it is done at minus 196 degrees Celsius in liquid nitrogen. Now, this is another uh, very common topic of the question. It usually comes. So liquid nitrogen is that compound or the chemical in which the pollen grains are stored for years. Now, see, stored uh, pollen can be used as pollen banks, right? It is a collection of pollen. So it can be used as pollen banks, same way how seeds are collected and stored in seed banks, right? We buy seeds from the retailers, right? Seed of certain plants. So how do they save or store seeds? So they do a seed bank. They store it in a seed bank. Same way, the pollen which is stored through the process of this cryopreservation or, you know, storing it into the liquid nitrogen at 196 degrees Celsius. So that is known as pollen bank. It can be used as pollen bank and it is similar to seed banks. And where it is used? So it is used in crop breeding programs, meaning wherein you want to develop a new crop. So you would need seeds, right? And maybe you want to develop a different part of crop that is not present in your country and you want a different plant that is present in a different country. So you, you would ask for the seeds of those plants. So that seed or those seeds would come from a different country to yours and you will do the crop breeding. And it is possible because the, the pollen grains can be stored. There is a process of storage, right? Understood? All right, so is there any doubt in the topics that we have discussed up till now? Any doubts? Or do you want some time to write it down? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. So there's nothing you want to ask me? Anything that you want to ask me from the topic? No, no. I think I asked you as soon as I got the thing. Okay, good. So do you remember the three allergy-causing pollens? The names of those three allergy causing pollens? Amaranthus, Chinopodia, and Parthenium. Parthenium. Yes, Parthenium, Amaranthus, and Chinopodium. So those are the three plants whose 
pollen are allergic and what are the two kinds of you know chronic respiratory diseases that pollen cause asthma and bronchitis good okay uh, which cell is bigger the generative cell or the vegetative cell the vegetative cell okay the structure which is made up of cellulose which is present in plant is known as cell wall okay intain is made up of cellulose and pectin exine is made up of sporopollen okay in 60% of the angiosperms the pollens are shed at which cell stage two cell stage and can you tell me something about the three cell stage um in the three cell stage the generative cell further mitotic cell which is equational division divides into two more cells so hence why it is known cells. as yes. what are yes. those cells called the uh, the generative cells divided mitotically and it formed two cells what are those two cells called Oh, I don't. I don't remember. They are known as the male gametes, the two male gametes. Okay, so mm -hmm. the veget, uh, the generative cell when it divides, it forms two male gametes, and that division is mitotic, meaning there is no reduction over there. Okay, uh, do the pollen viability does it like depend on temperature and humidity? Yes, ma'am. Okay. can you tell me the name of the small but no, sorry uh, the prominent aperture where the sporopollen is not present what is it called germ pore germ pore yes and um, can you tell me is the intine entire or is it is is it interrupted the intine is interrupted because it is a no it is entire it is a thin and continuous yes it is continuous there is no yeah, interruption because there is, there is no opening there okay all right um yeah uh, can you tell me something about microsporogenesis um microsporogenesis is the process of pollen grains um developing from pollen mother cells through meiosis okay but That as the means. name suggests it is microsporogenesis so you would say that it is the formation of microspore okay not pollen grains here microspore pollen grains are formed later on right okay now can you tell me uh if i say um okay what kind of division takes place in the sporogenous tissue mitotic division yes and what is formed after that division pollen mother cells pollen mother cells and pollen mother cells undergo which division meiosis meiosis and what it forms um it forms pollen sacs pollen sacs or there was something for ah uh, microspore tetrad microspore tetrad okay so um during okay so is the tetrad directly formed into a tetrad or is there a middle stage there there is a middle there is a middle stage over there and what is so that first it yes first it undergoes meiosis 1 and then it yes. gives us dyad yes, and then it good. undergoes meiosis 2 and gives us microspore tetrad excellent very good okay now can you tell me uh, what is the usual structure of pollen grain a shape shape the usual shape it is spherical <laughs> and it is about 25 to 50 micrometers and that that 25 to 50 micrometers is what is it the radius is it the diameter diameter it's the diameter okay so i'm so happy that you are learning here only 
it's nice it will it'll be easy for you also okay can you tell me the name of the three families wherein the pollens are shed at the three cell stage Okay, fine. It's all right. The first one is rosacea. Then there is uh, leguminous. No, I I remember, but then I thought this was I thought this was viability. No, I think I didn't. No, you were no, you asked me the viability question. Viability only. It was viability only. But there are some plants wherein this three cell stage also happens. Okay, but not necessarily in them only. But this is particularly for viability. You are right. And what is their viability? Months, two months? Several months. It is not okay. given how many months, but several months. Okay. Okay. Uh, that is all for today. Okay. Uh, can you tell me why is pollen used as a food supplement? Because it is rich in nutrients and it's particularly high in protein. Okay. And what are the two forms or ways by which I can consume uh, pollen? Tablets and syrups. Okay. And what does it do? Like, uh, what, what does pollen do? Like, okay, fine, it is rich in nutrients and all that. But what does it do to me? Why will I eat it? It provides you with instant energy. That's why usually most athletes and resources consume it. Okay. Very good. So the whole topic is clear to you. Okay, the whole topic is done. All right, so you can call your mother, then I can talk to her. Um, yes, now my mother said that the next time there is a lesson, she will just like to monitor the way you're teaching. That's it. Sorry, I can't hear you. What? Uh, my mother says that um, the next time you're teaching, she would just like to monitor the way you're teaching. That's all. Okay, okay. But there's nothing she wants to talk to me about. No, ma'am, I think I misunderstood her question. All right, all right. It's okay. So uh, is there anything that you want to ask me uh, since the, we are running out of time? I think two minutes are only left the class, right? Uh, yes, no, 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 there's nothing else. I don't there's nothing else. Okay. Now see, for the next class, we will be uh, starting with the gynoecium, which is the female gametophyte. Okay. And then we'll talk more about that. And then we'll finally come to the fertilization and what all events happen. Do you understand pollination? Yes, ma'am. Okay, then we'll also discuss pollination. We'll discuss. Now, we did discuss the microspore. Now, see, there are two terms. The first one is microspore, then there is megaspore. Okay, so wherever you see megaspore, just, just fit it in your mind that it is related to the female. female. Yes, and whenever you see microspore, that it is related to the male. Clear? Yeah? Okay. Uh, uh, is the whole process of division or the microsporogenesis is clear to you? Yes, ma'am. You, you can write answers on it? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Now, see, uh, whenever you get asked the question of this microsporogenesis, see uh, how I drew uh, here with arrows, like this one. You see, like I in indicated it with arrows here. This whole part. Yes, yes, you can do this also. Like you can first write this and then explain what happens and how it divides and everything. So that'll also shape your answer very nice. 